I'm really excited to see this challenger Arna just crushing this field. Plenty of results under his belt in the past, but wanting a title and trying to get past one of the biggest things in the game to get it. Yeah, you look opposite the table, you see Javier Dominguez. This is someone who's basically done it all that there is to do in Magic. And I can feel that Arne wants to get to that same spot. He wants to win it all. He wants to be world champion one day. And you know what? He might well do it. Starting off with a win here today would be absolutely amazing for the young player. So let's get things underway here. Take a look at the opening hands. Not a terrible starting hand here for Arne. Anything he's not too happy to see here? Disdainful stroke not great in this matchup. We do see that Great Henge, we do see that Gold Span Dragon, but on average, a lot of Javier's cards cost three or less. Uh, that goes doubly for this specific build of Teamer. Javier, one of the Teamer players this weekend that did not bring any copies of Alrin's Epiphany. This is a change that we have seen, perhaps a nod towards Sultai or some of the more aggressive decks where you don't want the more expensive sorcery, and it definitely gives him points in a matchup that is typically somewhat unfavored for Teamer, he's already beaten Arne once this weekend. Hey, don't take away from Arne beating Javier once this weekend, too. This is kind of like the settling match here, if we can call it that, but it, that was, of course, in Historic where Arne beat him, so he's going to be looking to pick up a victory here in the standard portion of things. Yeah, Arne's hand starting to shape up Thieves Skills Enforcer, a fine follow-up for Javier. No adventure creatures yet, so this Edgewall Innkeeper looking a little awkward. It, Arne certainly doesn't know that at the moment, though can perhaps guess, but the fact is he's not going to play into it anyways. He has that copy of Didn't Say Please up. He's going to sit back and adventure creature right on time. <laughs> Bone Crusher Giant arriving exactly when he needs to along with the Edgewell Innkeeper on the board, can start steamrolling the card advantage there. But we do see that Arne has the Didn't Say Please in hand. Uh, they won't stop the trigger from the Edgewell Innkeeper, but can keep the Bone Crusher Giant off the battlefield if he chooses to. There is a consideration for Javier here to just play the Kazandu Mammoth. Kazandu Mammoth plus the Landfall trigger would put it at 5 power mm -hmm. next turn, which would allow Javier to cast the Great Henge if he so chooses. But it is also tempting for him to just pass with this Stomp. And if Arne goes for something like this exact Thieves Guild Enforcer on Javier's end step, this is perfect. He'll be able to Stomp it down before Arne can untap and leave his counter spells up again. These Guild Enforcer will mill away two cards there. And the turn passes back to Arne, who... seems to be waiting for the inevitable stomp here from Javier Dominguez. Javier passing the turn back does give Arne the option of countering, which Arne should happily take here. Mm -hmm. And it, Javier got to play around some cards on the end step regardless by making Arne tap this mana, but he doesn't have a great follow-up here. He's not casting the Great Henge. He's not casting Goldspan Dragon yet. So tapping Arne out in this turn isn't as valuable as, for example, tapping him out going into his turn five, which mm -hmm. would be significant because he could resolve this Goldspan Dragon. And instead, the result is Arne got to keep Thieves Guild Enforcer, and Javier is facing down actual pressure now. Yeah, Edgewell Innkeeper, not afraid of any flash creatures this time around, gets him for the one point of damage. Thieves Guild Enforcer off the top also has an Into the Story and a Disdainful Stroke to protect against any big, powerful spells from heavier side of things. But first things first, let's get him for four points of damage, an extra mill there off the Wind Robber. Yeah, Arne has now made it past the turns where Disdainful Stroke isn't impressive. The turns where you expect Javier to be going Edgewall Innkeeper, Adventure Creatures, and you're holding a counter spell that does nothing. Now we're at the point of the game where Disdainful Stroke looks great. You see a Great Henge, you counter it. Yep. And for Arna, this is wonderful because he has this aggressive force. He has double Thieves Guild Enforcer to put on pressure. And most importantly, he has the follow-up. He has that into the story. He is a little scared of Mystical Dispute from Javier. Javier does play three copies of Mystical Dispute in the main deck, but this is a position where Arne is somewhat okay with just sitting back on this aggressive force and trying to put pressure back on Javier going the other way. Here comes the Thieves Guild Enforcer. Can trade with the Kazandi Mammoth here if he so chooses. Otherwise, like you said, he could just keep being aggressive and swing in with the 7 power next turn. 
Yeah, you see Arne considering it. I don't think he's in the market for a trade here. I think with Javier at 10, one mana remaining, land drop already made, meaning the only thing Javier is representing here is a heart's desire as a blocker. A Arne could reasonably just choose to attack back, but playing it safe, keeping the board clear from Javier, certainly a safe line of play here from the rogue player. Ooh, nice pick up there in Soaring Thought Thief. Into the story is going to see that there's no mystical dispute in hand. Finds a rune crab, Agadim's Awakening, and another into the story. So a very, very nice find there indeed. As Soaring Thought Thief adds to the power on the board, and in come the cavalry four and two. Coming on through, down to four goes Javier. Yeah, six damage coming on through, and now Arne has put Javier in the awkward position where even if he attacks with Goldspan Dragon to leave up Saw it coming, he would die on board, so he actually has to sit back. And this isn't a great position here from Javier's point of view to be just sitting back with your mana and uh, with Rose having the opportunity to do whatever they would like. Yeah, basically into the story just being, you know, thrown out there. He's like, all right, cool. I'm ahead. Let's keep going. Fortunately for Javier, not a great into the story from mm -hmm. Arna. Just finds three lands and another Thief Skilled Enforcer. And this means that Arna can't attack with anything but the Enforcer. So Javier will get to untap with the Goldspan Dragon. But this is one of the shortcomings of this build. When you don't have Alrin's Epiphany, you don't get to chain these explosive turns once you have the Dragon. You just kind of can fizzle. Yeah. And Fizzle he did, unfortunately, for Javier. The first match, well, first game, they're going to Arne Hushenbeth, rather convincingly with the rogues, getting to do that aggressive attacking that they do so well as soon as there's multiple rogues down on the battlefield. So what does Javier need to do going into game two? He'll want to bring his curve down a bit. If possible, he'll want to play the aggressive role. That is where he felt short that game. Big card coming in, three copies of Ox of Agonis. Not only does it do a great job of keeping your graveyard small to make sure none of the rogue's creatures are growing, but it will also help supplement your aggressive plan by continuing to refill your hand much better than something like the Great Henge would in this matchup because it is recursive and sticky. Uh, you see Javier so committed to the aggressive game plan, he's actually considering not bringing in Elder Gargaroth, which is a very good creature against rogues, but perhaps just not where Javier sees himself being in this matchup. Hey, I'm all for the aggressive approach here, and if this is what's going to get the job done here against rogues, go for it, Javier. Yeah, on the other side, for Arna, it, things not really as many options. You see him boarding down a little heavier. He knows those wind robbers lose a lot of value once oxes come in and Javier's graveyard will not often be at the point where you can just sacrifice the wind robber for cards. You'll get another counter spell or two taken out and just board a little differently. But again, it's really going to come down to these oxes post board. If Javier doesn't find the escape creatures early, Arne can just run over the game again like he did in game one. Take a look at the opening hands here. Javier Dominguez likes what he sees. He's going to keep that. And Arne is also happy with what he's got. So let's get things underway here. Game two of our upper finals. It's Arne Hushenbeth versus Javier Dominguez. Both of these players looking to nab that first grand final spot. So keep it here. Let's see. We could have a determined winner after this game. But Javier will certainly hope not. Lots of potential in this hand from Javier. No real payoffs yet. No adventure creatures. The best thing he has to do with the remainder of his mana is an Obosh. And you see him just leaving up this mystical dispute. But Javier, no follow-up at the moment. He needs to draw out of this. Yeah, Crack Crown Pathway isn't what he wants to see. You can just see by the expression on his face. <laughs> it's like, all right, thank you, Lance. I don't need any more of you. Something off the top, some action would be wonderful here. Yeah, and Javier just really hoping that he can at least try to bluff his strength 
to Arne. You saw Arne didn't play that Thieves Guild Enforcer at the end of that first turn. The reason for that is it's not attacking into a Jesper Sentinel anyways. If you play it, you're exposing it to a potential stomp from Javier. You're giving him targets for his spells that you don't need to. So you see Arne holding this back. We've seen this line from Rogues against Teamer and other Bone Crusher decks, Bone Crusher Giant decks before, is you want to sit back and only play your Enforcers or your Rogues. Once you can do multiples or you can leave up counter spells and really make sure you're getting good value out of them. Yeah, it's always it feels bad when you're... I call them powerful one drops. They are pretty powerful in this format. When they just land on the board and get dealt with straight away, you really want to follow up. In the Edge Wing Keeper's case, you're looking for an adventure creature. In the Thieves Guild Enforcer's case, you're looking for a rogue to follow up with that or keep it safe until the next turn. Yeah, Javier really in need of help here as he, he continues turn after turn to not do much. A single adventure creature could really enable what this hand is doing. And there you go. There's an adventure creature. Asking you shall receive good old Bone Crusher Giant rocking up on time. One benefit right now for Javier is Arna has not milled him at all. There are zero cards in Javier's graveyard. So not worried about a drowned lock. And more importantly, he's not worried about leaving not leaving up mystical dispute and walking into something like into the story that is just not a concern for javier right now with that just borrow sentinel if he wants he can actually consider countering this essence scatter and still be able to play the bone crusher giant but mm -hmm. i like this safe line this is what arne has shown us time and time again is this is how he likes to play he likes to be safe and now he can just play bone crusher giant using the just borrow sentinel to ensure he has mystical dispute up otherwise arne could go removal spell in to try to resolve something. So finally, Javier Dominguez gets his adventure game plan online, courtesy of Bone Crusher Giants, and also leaving up a mystical dispute to help him out. Won't be able to do anything about the Thieves Guild Enforcer for now, but he will be able to counter and into the story should it come online next turn. Yeah, now the things are going in Javier's favor and he is putting on pressure. Arna feels the need to mill some cards and put himself in a position where if he draws another rogue, he can try to get the number of cards he needs in the graveyard to turn on this into the story. At the moment, this hand is still awkward for him, so he is lacking. He may need to cycle this cling to dust by exiling one of the spells from his own graveyard just to try to get the gas he needs because... Javier's board is going to get out of hand really quickly. Edgewall Innkeeper tends to create a chain effect where one adventure creature can lead to another and another and another, and the card advantage just doesn't stop until it's removed. Consideration here from Arnit to get Luris into hand. But I quite like the th thought of clinging to dust to just get some extra cards out of your library and try and find something else to do on this turn. Yeah, putting Loris into hand is tempting in that it allows you to block with the Thieves Guild Enforcer on the Bone Crusher Giant mm -hmm. and replay it next turn to mill two more cards. It, considering everything Arne is looking for right now comes down to putting cards in Javier's graveyard, two more mill is not irrelevant, and it may be enough to tempt Javier into not attacking here. And that's something that Arne would really like to see is no pressure on his life total while he's in these setup turns. One thing you mentioned in the first game was that Disdainful Stroke is quite awkward in the first few turns of the game, and we're seeing that here now, because if I'm not mistaken, Javier boarded out most of his four costed spells in Greater. We, you know, I don't think he's got any copies of the Great Engine here, so that's potentially a dead counterspell in hand for Arne. I think if Disdainful Stroke was awkward in game one, it is horrible in game two. If I remember correctly, Javier actually boarded out every single card in his deck that costs more than three. I don't think he has any copies of Goldspan Dragon left. It's just this Obosh that is the target. Now, fortunately, Obosh, because it's a companion, you can reasonably expect to see it at some point every game. Mm -hmm. But other than that, Disdainful Strokes don't really have targets in these post-board games. So just playing it safe here as Javier is going to bring Obosh the Prey Pierce into hand. We'll have Mystical Dispute in case of a Disdainful Stroke that we see in Arna's hand. But here we're going to see the Cling to Dust. Drawing a card, finding another Thieves Guild Enforcer. All right, so the mill plan can get going here. Yeah, At Thieves Guild Enforcer, to. great draw. That That's four mill from the two Enforcers. Uh, and that is what... Arna needs to turn this into the story into a castable card now. So this is a good 
position for Arna, as it were, in terms of getting his game plan rolling, but it's not a good position in the actual game, considering he's under quite a lot of pressure, and Javier can still play this Brazen Borrower and leave up Mystical Dispute, draw another card, and add more to the board. So, Thieves Guild Enforcer, threatening an attack, but uh, gonna think twice about that one. And on the end step, here we're gonna see a Brazen Borrower cost, Edgewell Innkeeper trigger, card draw here, Javier Dominguez, and nothing that Arne can do about it. Yeah, Arne not really in a position to go something like Thieves Guild Enforcer and into the story while Javier only had the one mana up on the end step because he knows about this Obosh. If he takes that line and Javier just resolves Obosh through this mystical dispute, it's disastrous for Arne. Yeah, he's going to have a bet. Sorry, indeed. just staple stroke, not missile dispute. But this is the only target that is in the deck right now. So Arna needs to use this to staple stroke on this Obage and make sure that the powerful companion doesn't come onto the board. Have you quite happy with that exchange? Disdainful stroke for the Obosh. And now here we're going to see a Thieves Guild Enforcer jump in front here. But Mystical Dispute is going to say no thank you very much, perhaps. Javier looking at his cards in Graveyard, that would be 8 if it resolved thanks to both Enforcer's tr triggers, and that would mean that that Enforcer would get Death Touch. This is really bad now. Yeah, Arna's in very big trouble here. Into the story, still not turned on as we can see. He's got two copies of it. One was scribed to the top earlier. Luris can bring a Thieves Guild Enforcer back. That would put Javier at seven cards in the graveyard. Next turn into the stories would be castable, but only three mana maximum available to Arna this turn means that no one to the story for this turn, and the now is the problem right now for Arna. Yeah. He's not oh. dead yet, but the Soul Seer off the top of the library is a great answer to one of these threats here. The it's saving, not looking super good. The saving grace for Arna is Soul Seer is the eighth card in the graveyard. So mm -hmm. for Javier to use it on this Luris pre-combat would mean that he's giving Arne the go-ahead for this Thieves Guild Enforcer to become online. So I think we'll see Javier attack first. Arna will want to chump with the Thieves Guild Enforcer, mm -hmm. and then Javier can Soul Seer the Luris post-combat once the Enforcer is gone, or Arna doesn't block and just goes to four, and that's okay too for Javier. So we will see the Thieves Guild Enforcer jump in the way here of the Bone Crusher Giant. Down to eight goes Arna. And the follow-up will be the Kazandu Mammoth, as well as the Soul Seer, potentially. Yeah, you see Javier once again putting a stop on Arna's upkeep, wanting to use it at a point where he can potentially get some cards out of Arne's hand, but by giving the turn to Arne and not using the Soul Seer, he's giving Arne the go-ahead to play one of these Thieves Guild Enforcers off Luris at instant speed. So at this point, Javier is committed to not using the Soul Seer until Arne acts. Arne fires off and into the story, and in response, Soul Seer is going to take care of Luris of the Dream Den. Does get the Thieves Guild Enforcer back, though, mulling a couple more cards. Let's see what he finds off the top of the library here with Into the Story. Mystical Dispute, Thieves Guild Enforcer, Zagoth Triome, and another Into the Story. So a good refill there for Arna. But is it too little, too late? I don't think so. I think with that Eliminate, Arne has an answer for the Kazanda Mammoth, an answer for the Bone Crusher Giant. If Javier doesn't top deck something, he's only presenting five damage. Arna can go down to three, but with two copies of Into the Story in hand, it's not going to take much for him to get an edge in this game. So this draw from Javier <laughs> is a complete blank, and I think Arna may be close to stabilizing this game. I think you're right, Marnie. As Kazandu Mammoth triggers, it's now a 5 5. Will we see a swing in here with the team? Hit the big red button. There we go. Five attackers coming on in, but we know that there is an answer for the biggest creature on the board in hand there for Arna. Yeah, and Arna doesn't need to worry about leaving up something like a mystical dispute. He's working with full known information. He can go eliminate on Kazandu Mammoth, block the Bone Crusher Giant with the Thieves Guild Enforcer, untap it three life, and suddenly he has a lot to work with. The other consideration here is going down to two instead and using the eliminate on the Brazen Borrower because he doesn't have a way to deal with the flying creature at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
So first things first, going for the Thieves Guild Enforcer. Looks like he's quite happy to take care of the two biggest creatures on the ground first, and then perhaps we'll see the eliminate next turn. This is actually much better than the line I mentioned as well, because now he gets to clear off the two largest creatures and stay at three, playing around a potential top deck stomp, which is the other consideration. Still has the Eliminate in hand for the Brazen Borrower the next turn, and that means he's not dying to the two creatures on the board. I think he's also got enough here for a pretty decent Agadim's Awakening. Yeah, I believe with Agadim's Awakening as another option, he also has the Cling to Dust. I think he may be in the market for just using Eliminate plus Into the Story this turn, leaving up the Cling to Dust should he need it. Mm -hmm. And I think next turn, he could go Agadim's Awakening, getting back his Lurus plus a Thieves Guild Enforcer and another Thieves Guild Enforcer off of the Lurus ability. That would be a good way to get some blockers down on this battlefield and some incidental life gain too. Oh, but it looks oh, like we're going oh, for oh, into the story. We time. find a good old crab. <laughs> oh, Ar Arne's feeling great now. That's a blocker. That's an yep. eliminate on the brazen borrower and a hard counter in drown and lock. Super good find there for Arne Huchabeth, who is looking like he is stabilizing here. So first things first, get rid of that pesky flyer. He certainly has enough mana to go Ruin Crab plus Fabled Passage if he wanted to. So perhaps this is actually very intentional and deliberate sequencing from Arna. He doesn't want to mill Javier mm -hmm. into a potential Ox while he doesn't have a counter spell or two counter spells up for it. Next turn, he can actually leave up Dreadlock and Mystical Dispute. So you see Arna actually deciding not to mill Javier that turn, recognizing that he could mill him into an Ox while his defenses are down. Yeah, especially against decks that are known to have a good post-board plan against rogues like the ox like polokranos it's always a good thing to you know hold off on the mill it's always satisfying to mill people but not when there's a big old ox that can just refill javier's hand here no ox there mm -mm. see Javier you're getting a little bit frustrated it's like where are you you bovine idiot yeah arne can just pass here he has a soaring thought thief to eat a blocker he has an illuminate on top oh, goodness me and another into destroying. the story <laughs> oh goodness and Arna you see certainly... the timing there. Mm -hmm. oh. You see Arna do into the story on Javier's upkeep just to make sure that he's not discarding cards. Eliminates one of the Edgewall innkeepers. So if Javier was to draw an adventure creature, he wouldn't get a guaranteed two cards off of it. And it, it's just every turn because of these three chained into the stories, the game is falling further and further away from Javier. And he's desperately in need of an Ox of Agonis to try to refill his hand. But at this point, with double Dranlock for Arna plus a Mystical Dispute, he He's really able to tax Javier's mana and cards in Graveyard should the game get to a point where he finds an Ox. Yeah, and he also has the uh, Cling to Dust if the opportunity ever presents itself to get the Ox out of the Graveyard. So things are not looking very good here for the former world champion Javier Dominguez. And I think the expression on his face tells you he feels the same. Yeah, Arne very happy to mill at sorcery speed because of that cling to dust. He doesn't want to mill on Javier's turn at a time where it would allow Javier to escape that ox. Six more cards in the bin, still no ox. Hey, at this here. point, I don't think it matters. I think I'm Arne done. is just fully set. He has more than enough mana. He has that cling to dust, and it, I, I don't see a way for Javier to stabilize this game anymore. Mm-mm certainly locked and loaded with all the counter spells that he could possibly hope for and now happy to start chipping away at the life total of Javier Dominguez down to 18 he goes he's sitting at three it's certainly not comfortable there's an ox and Javier is going to be met with the unfortunate news that Arne just has everything he could possibly need to deal with it yeah I think he'll want to use Drown and Lock to counter this and force Javier to use some resources. The problem with countering Ox is you cannot use Cling to Dust until after uh, 
Javier passes priority. So once yeah. Ox goes in the graveyard, Javier can immediately escape it, meaning cling to dust is not a direct counter at the moment. This is what Arna is somewhat afraid of. He has a line available to him of letting the Ox resolve killing it and then using cling with the trigger on the stack, but that still gives Javier three cards. So the options aren't great there. And it, it looks like he may actually be considering letting this Ox resolve. Oh to my drum God. Unlock. This is genius. He created another card on the stack. This means Javier doesn't get priority <laughs> until Arne Hushimbeth playing this game perfectly. By creating another card on the stack, he doesn't give Javier the priority that he needs to cast this ox from the graveyard, and now he can cling <gasps> it. That was amazing. What a play by Arne Hushimbeth. Just not giving Javier Dominguez any inch there. Incredible stuff here. From Javier uh, looks so player. defeated. You see him <sighs> shaking his head. And time and time again this weekend, Arna has just been playing spectacular magic. We expect nothing less from players of this caliber. Javier Dominguez is one of the game's greatest players. Here comes an Agadim's Awakening. This is all but going to steal done. it. And that is the game. The upper finalist is Arna Huschenbeth of Germany. He is going to be our very first grand finalist. But have your fans do not fret, he's not out of it yet. He goes down into the lower final, to, into the lower bracket to fight for his life there. But congratulations, Arne Huchenbeth. What an absolutely expertly navigated game, Money.